Hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar. Today we'll be looking at the application process. This webinar is uh, geared towards prospective postgraduate students. There is a similar one running this afternoon for undergraduate students, but hopefully everyone in today is a prospective postgraduate student interested in applying to SOAS. My name's Dan, um, I work in the UK student recruitment team. I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, Laura and Lisa. They're going to be in the background answering your questions um, as we go. You are able to submit those questions um, using the questions and the chat box that's available to you. So as we go through the session today, as I'm talking to you, please do feel free to pop any questions you have into the chat. Laura and Lisa will do their best to answer as we go through. And then at the end, we also have some time set aside for Q&A too. So as we get started, I thought uh, a nice introduction would be to show you some of the sort of key uh, subject areas that we focus on at SOAS. As a university, we're world renowned for our study of um, research into Africa, Asia and the Middle East. You'll see that there's a whole variety of different subject areas available and we truly have hundreds of different degrees that are available for students to come and study. Um, there's so much choice and so much availability and that really is something that's very special about what we have on offer at SOAS. So hopefully within here you might be able to pick out something that you're interested in. Our website has a full detail of all of the different courses within each of the subject areas. So just because you see one area here, that will actually break down into a whole number of different courses as well that are available within it. So if you're interested in a kind of particular area, but you don't know the exact course that you're looking to study just yet, I'd recommend having a look on the website, uh, drilling down into the courses that are available. And then within there, you can actually look at the modules that are available, the program specification, and get a really good understanding and overview of what that course will be like for you when you come to study with us. Um, a couple of the highlights and some of the things that we're really most known for, uh, development studies you'll see on here. Uh, we also have specialisms in law, in economics, politics, gender studies, and then some really fantastic regional specialities that uh, aren't available at too many other universities. So you might like to check out some of those or something that you're interested in as well. Once you've found that subject that you're interested in, it's important to then start thinking about whether you'll be able to apply to study with us. And one of those, uh, one of the most fundamental things to consider at the beginning is the entry requirements that we're asking for. For people, uh, for students wanting to come on to our uh, regular master's degrees, we're looking for a minimum of a sort of high 2-2 or international equivalent in your bachelor's, your undergraduate degree. Um, for lots of people, it is very, very helpful to have some previous studies that are related to your program uh, where possible. Now, we do realise and understand that some students, uh, you might study one thing, uh, undergraduates, and then you might work for a few years or your interests might develop and change. And we, we understand that, we appreciate that and know that sometimes your undergraduate course won't translate directly to what you do come and actually study. So that is the opportunity in your uh, personal statement, your supporting statement to talk about that and I'll come on to this in a little bit. But if you do have previous studies that relate to your programme, um, that is fantastic, that is something that can definitely help you with getting to where you need to be. Um, alongside this you might also find that there's some work experience that you've done. So if you've taken some years out of study since your undergraduate degree, you've worked in a particular discipline or profession, that might sort of broadened your interest and your scope and um, opened up some new opportunities for you. And we can see that work experience as actually being um, crucial and helping you to actually develop your interests and to decide which program you might then want to come on and study at postgraduate level. Some of the courses might find, uh, might specify um, some particular experiences that you might need to have had or that would be helpful as well. So. It's worth looking out for any of those specific um, program, um, pro yeah, program specific, sorry, entry requirements that are asked for. You can find all of these types of things, again, on the website. If you head onto those subject pages, you'll see 
a heading and a box for entry requirements and this will stipulate everything that's needed for the particular course that you're interested in so do make sure that once you've found the program that you're particularly interested in that you explore any of the specific entry requirements that are needed for your course some students may find that they want to take part in a pre-masters program um, as I asked, this is called the um, FDPS, Foundation Diploma for Postgraduate Study. Um, this is really designed for international students who want to study for a postgraduate taught degree or even a research degree at later stages um, at a British university. But it's for those who um, may need to, um, uh, who maybe are sort of wanting to develop a number of different things. So firstly, it could be that you have an undergraduate degree already, um, and that might meet the requirements of entry, but you're looking to develop your English or your academic study skills um, to allow you to succeed at uh, the UK University at SOAS that you might be wishing to come to. So that will help you to really prepare for master's study. It could be that you have a full undergraduate degree, um, but you're wishing to actually change the focus of your study. So you might have studied one thing at undergraduate level and you're wanting to completely change that for postgraduate study um, but you haven't got the sort of necessary background experience or that work experience that we've touched upon that might have indicated why that change is happening so this will again help you to develop and deepen your knowledge um, of the relevant sort of subject area that you're then looking to study or it could also be that um, your previous studies haven't actually allowed you to meet the academic entry requirements. So this could be based on uh, the degree you've done. Um, and if it doesn't sort of meet what, what we're asking for in our entry requirements, then this programme will um, help you to um, sort of apply and add value to your academic performance. So that pre-master's year will really act as a foundation for you to be able to um, move on to the course that you're looking for. And there is a good level of um, uh, progression on from those courses so students who do actually achieve a minimum level uh, of academic and English language performance on the FTPS the pre-masters are guaranteed progression onto many of our postgraduate programs um, and they will also actually receive a 10% discount off their tuition fees so that's also a nice little bonus as well so this might be one thing for you to uh, bear in mind and consider So now moving on to um, how to apply. Firstly, looking at taught master's courses. There is an online application form and online application hub, and this is the main place where you'll be um, uh, submitting your application. There's a variety of things that you'll be asked to submit. Um, firstly, we'll look for some general biographical um, information about you. So information about you, maybe where you've studied before, uh, any suitable work experience that you wish to include, um, contact details, that sort of stuff. There is then a box that asks for um, your choice of programme, and you'll notice that we ask you for a first and second choice. Now, you only have to submit a first choice, which um, is for everyone, but some people may wish to then be considered for a second choice if for any reason they weren't eligible for their first or primary choice. So you'll only be considered for that second one if you choose to submit one and B if you weren't um, eligible for your first choice of course. So you don't need to worry about that too much if you see the box that says second choice and you haven't thought about a second one. Um, but it's just there for those students who might wish to submit one. Now importantly as I touched upon earlier there is the opportunity um, to submit a supporting statement and this is really a section that Will allow you and your interests to come through. With this supporting statement you have a thousand words roughly to tell us about your interest in the course, why you want to study the course, why you're suitable for it um, and this allows you to really personalise the application and that's something that is so incredibly important. Lots of the information on your application uh, will be just sort of um, quite general about you and uh, might be quite numeric or um, in short form answers whereas this supporting statement really does yeah allow you to flourish and to shine through and to show us why you will be suitable for the course that you're looking to study 
In addition, we do ask for a CV or resume. Where possible, try to have this as up to date as possible. If there are any gaps, then this can leave us wondering what you were doing during that time. So please do try to complete it as much as possible. Don't worry if um, maybe you were doing some work that wasn't quite exactly relevant to the postgraduate course you're going on to. All of this helps us to build up a picture of who you are as an applicant, as a prospective student, um, what your experiences have been so far and how that all contributes to that wider application that you're making um, and how you will fit in as a student at SOAS. In addition, we'll ask for information about your previous academic qualifications. Depending on where you are in the journey, this could be your uh, current transcripts as they stand. You might have already graduated and have your full certificates and full transcripts, then in which case you can submit all of those. If you are a current undergraduate student and don't have um, all of these documents completed fully, then you'll be able to send them into our admissions team at a later date. So just use your transcripts as they stand at the moment. Um, something else that we will um, ask for is for you to demonstrate your English language proficiency. It's worth noting that if you do need to demonstrate this, potentially if you're an international student, um, maybe you're doing this through an exam such as IELTS, that we don't require that information and the results immediately, but it will be required at some point in the application process. So you can submit your application um, to begin with without those without those results. But if you are having to demonstrate them, again, you will need to send that in at a later date. However, if you have already taken these exams, you have your scores already, um, please do submit them. It just, again, adds to your application and gives us a better understanding um, of where your English language proficiency sits, um, potentially any extra support that might be needed or extra courses you can take. And again, I'll touch upon these in a little while. Something which um, can be a little bit different from university to university is that we are not asking um, immediately up front for references. Um, there is the opportunity, there is the possibility, sorry, that the admissions team might read your application and they might need some clarification about certain things so they can send further questions or they may also ask you then to um, submit a reference and submit the details for a reference. So maybe have someone in mind who you can approach, but just be aware that you don't have to submit this as part of the application. So for those students who are maybe considering uh, one of our online or distance learning masters, the application is similar, but slightly different. So there is a different form that you need to submit. This is found on the specific pages for the online and distance learning masters courses. This online application form, again, covers uh, general information about you, contact details, those things that we've already mentioned. There is, again, a personal statement, but take note that this is actually 500 words, so it's shorter than the one previously talked about. Again, though, the personal statement still serves for you to explain your interest in the course, your desire to study it, um, where that uh, interest has come from, um, and for you to really explain um, how um, how you will develop your academic abilities and to study and how suited you'll be to study that course as well. So again, make sure that you do uh, place some importance on that personal statement and you use that really as, your, as the opportunity to make um, the personal element of your application come through. Again, there'll be some supporting documents that you'll need to submit, things like transcripts or certificates from previous studies. Um, and I'll talk a bit about supporting documents as well on the next slide. And again, information there about English language proficiency. So you'll see that some of it is uh, similar to the things I've already spoken about, but there are some slight changes. So just make sure that you're using the right application form for the course that you're intending to study. With supporting documents, um, just know that we will require a uh, certified English translation if the document is not natively in English. So there will be two things there that we're going to ask for. One will be the original copy of the document in its original language and then secondly will be that certified English translation. Our website does detail um, places um, of uh, translation companies and people that you can use so if this is the case for you then you can check on there. We will also have to uh, cross-check all international qualifications and institutions um, using the um, 
NARIC database. So that's something as well um, just to be aware of. This is just to ensure that um, the institution you've studied at and the qualifications you've studied at are all legitimate. If the admissions team did have any questions about this afterwards, then they'll get in touch with you directly. So that's not something for you to worry about really at this stage, um, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, and yeah, alongside that as well, with those documents that you submit, and this applies to everyone, we do need scanned original copies. Um, sometimes um, you might find that with a university transcript or certificate, it can be stamped by the issuing university's registry. That's also um, really helpful. So as much, um, yeah, with all of those documents, they need to be the scanned originals. If you do have any issues with that, then you'll need to contact the admissions team separately, um, sort of ask about that and um, ask about how you can source those documents if needed. So with your application, um, once you've submitted it, as I've mentioned, the admissions team will then be considering it. Um, your whole application is considered um, before any sort of decision is reached and communicated to you. So you do need to make sure that you've submitted a full application as much as possible. And this will um, ensure that uh, there's as little opportunity for delays to take place. So that typical response time, that turnaround time is around four to six weeks. But during busier times, for example, when we approach the um, deadline for submission of applications, this can be a little bit longer. Rest assured, though, if you have submitted an application, the admissions team will be getting to it. They will get back to you. Um, but sometimes this can take a little while, especially, as I say, when it's a busy time of year. You'll receive that information by email um, and you'll be able to um, access a offer. Uh, you'll be able to access a link in your offer letter. And this is how you'll be able to then uh, reply to your offer. So once you receive that, click the, click the link that's in there. It's really important that you read your offer letter in full detail as well, because this might contain any other conditions um, of your offer. So make sure that you understand everything that's contained within. And if you do need to ask any questions about this, again, you'll be able to. To accept your offer, you will then have to pay a deposit. Currently for home students, this stands at £1,000. And for international students, overseas students, this stands at £2,000. There are some exemptions though. Um, so for students who are going to be fully funded by an official sponsor or scholarship, uh, it is possible for us to waive the deposit. We will need, however, full evidence that that is the case, um, and that you've made that application or are making that application. Um, but yeah, that is something for you to be aware of and you can contact the admissions team about that for the deposit waiver. Then once this is done, it's uh, time for you to really prepare for your studies and for different people. Um, this will look uh, like uh, this will be sort of individual to you, really. So it might be that you're completing your current undergraduate degree, ensuring that you get the best results there. For some international students, this might be that you need to apply for a study visa um, and submit a request for a CAS. So you can begin that process when it's time. Um, more information about those two particular things as well are available on our website in the international students section. So you can look at the timelines and how to go about those if needed. Um, it might be the case that you'll be moving to London to study and you might need to start thinking about accommodation as well. There's a whole host of different resources that are available to support you in preparing uh, to join us at SOAS. Now just moving on to some information about English language requirements and you might remember I touched upon these uh, previously when we were talking about submitting your application. So just to give you some more information about this. For students who are looking at uh, direct entry onto our postgraduate courses, you can see the typical um, results that we're asking for, the typical scores we're asking for in those um, English language tests. There are other ways and alternative sort of qualifications which can demonstrate English proficiency as well. There's a whole list of these available on our website, but I've selected three which uh, might be relevant to some of you. And these are available for and valid for uh, different lengths of time as well. So it could be that you've uh, completed A-level English or perhaps International Baccalaureate English. 
or you might have studied um, and obtained a degree recently from a certain English medium university as well. So that's uh, a couple of other ways, but if you do need to complete one of those English language tests, um, again, there's lots of information on our website about them. There is a link just at the bottom um, of the slide there. It's very easy to find all of that. Um, and then you can uh, find out um, how to go about completing one of those tests as well. For some students, they might be asked, and this can be a condition of your offer, which is to complete a pre-sessional or an in-sessional um, English course, and that can supplement your, that's to improve and supplement your English proficiency. Or if you're looking to um, begin on one of the pre-masters programmes, the FDPS that I was talking about earlier, then there are lower English requirements um, for this course. There are a few um, additional courses run by our Foundation College, which may be um, of interest to those of you who are needing to develop your English proficiency. First off is the Access to English Language Studies programme. This is an online 11-week um, programme, uh, sort of a training course to really prepare you um, to come and study at SOAS. It's designed to bridge the gap between roughly students who are at a 4.5 in IELTS um, and to bring them up to a 5.5. And this is designed for um, entry onto the pre-masters um, or onto the ELAS program, um, which is the second one on the screen. So the ELAS, English Language and Academic Studies, um, is a sort of language and study skill development program um, designed for international students, um, taking place over three or six months. Um, it's for those who hold a first undergraduate degree and are wishing to um, pursue a related postgraduate course. So that is a master's, a postgraduate degree, which is related and in a similar um, area and field of study to that undergraduate. That's designed for students who are currently sitting around a 5.5 on, on the IELTS to bring them up to um, the required scores. So I thought it might also be good just to talk briefly about funding your studies. There is further information um, available in webinar format. We do have a fees, funding and scholarships webinar coming up. So this isn't going to be in full depth, but I'm just going to touch upon some of the aspects that will be important for you to be considering. Um, and the dates of those future webinars will be shared at the end. So firstly, um, it's important to think about the tuition fees. For our regular postgraduate degrees, there are three bands of fees. So depending on which uh, subject you study, it will be in a particular band. For home students, the fees range from um, £11,980 up to £17,000. For international students, this ranges from £23,400 to £24,650. For our pre-masters, um, that's at 15,400. And for online distance learning, um, again, there is, a, there is a range here, depending on which programme you take, but that's currently, well, for this year, 2021-22, um, the current fees for 22-23 are just being finalised. Um, that's sitting at 10,270 to 12,000. So I'd expect a small increase in, um, in that for the coming year. The online distance learning, um, as we spoke about earlier, is a flexible sort of module by module system as well. So there is a pay by module option which is available, but um, the numbers that you see there are the sort of the total fees once all of those modules are considered. Just to highlight a little bit about funding as well, because I know that this can be a barrier for many students who are wishing to access postgraduate study, and it's really important to think about how you might actually be able to fund your time at university. For um, home students, depending on uh, where in the four nations you are um, and which awarding body you'll be applying to, there's a NONS means tested loan which is available. Um, so for example, in Student Finance England, um, that could be applied to, but as I say, there are some slight differences across the four nations and the different bodies. So um, I would just make sure that you check the relevant information to you. Um, the Student Finance England loan is available and that is just a um, set amount which is paid to you. So it's non-means tested, so it's just a set number. This can be used towards your tuition fees. Um, you might wish to use some of it to supplement living costs as well. 
um, it's up to you how that money is divided up and it's paid directly to you as opposed to being paid directly to the university if you're familiar with the undergraduate student loans system. For overseas students, this really does vary depending on the country that you're in, but often there is some country specific uh, financial aid which is available. I've highlighted two um, of the sort of big examples here, such as US uh, federal loans or Indian Credella loans. But again, depending on the country that you're based in, um, I would seek out some information about this. We do have lots of information again on our website, as I've mentioned. Um, so there are some more examples on there, and that goes into further detail. Um, so you might wish to explore that. And similarly, you might find it helpful to think about scholarships and other sort of awards which are available. At SOAS, we offer many scholarships ourselves. I've highlighted um, two particular ones here. Um, one is the International Postgraduate Scholarship. This is available for students from a number of different regions across the world who are looking to come and study at SOAS. Um, it's a partial fee waiver, so note it's not a full cover of all of the fees, it's just a partial fee waiver, um, but hopefully that is enough to help many of you to access uh, the postgraduate course that you're looking for. Again, eligibility criteria, information about how to submit an application for this is available on the website, as is the case for all of these other um, opportunities that are listed here and that I'll mention. For um, home students, there's a SOAS Master Scholarships. Um, there's around 40 awards usually available for this. Um, and again, it's not a full cover of fees, it's just a, it's just a partial amount. Um, there is a number of these usually allocated uh, for across a number of different subject areas as well so you can check out the information about that see if you're eligible to apply there are also a number of um, external funding opportunities with people that we have partnerships with so there's the uh, achieving um, awards there's also the commonwealth shared scholarship and the Said foundation just to name a, a handful of um, what is available as I say though, do check the website, that link just at the bottom there. There's a full table, it will give you information about who is eligible to apply for a particular award or scholarship, um, deadlines, information for submitting um, and eligibility criteria as well. So do make sure that you check all of that out. Now, just before we go on to the question and answer, I just wanted to highlight a couple of key dates for your diaries as well, for things you might wish to know. We have um, a number of open events coming up which may be of interest to you. So firstly is our postgraduate open evening. This was originally scheduled to be on campus. We are currently assessing the situation in the UK to ensure that we can deliver this uh, safely, successfully. Um, so we'll continue to monitor that. Um, and if it does need to be moved online, then that is a possibility as well. But as things stand currently today, that's still scheduled to be on campus. That's in uh, late February. We then have um, a couple of online events, the first being the Global Challenges Forum. This is a fantastic um, online forum which explores a variety of different themes of study and research that are available at SOAS. So that's quite a good um, introduction to the multidisciplinary aspects of learning which are available at our school. Postgraduate Taste today, this is to give you um, an insight into what each of the courses are like, what, it's, uh, what you can expect to study on a particular programme to meet academics to find out from them um, yeah, what it's like to study the subject you're interested in. There's also a um, event specifically for postgraduate offer holders so for those who have submitted an application and been made an offer by this date they'll be uh, sent an email invitation to come onto campus um, you know as, as long as that's possible and safe to um, attend our offer holder reception so this is a good way to meet other offer holders to meet current staff current students um, again to introduce you to SOAS and to the campus if you hadn't had the opportunity to visit so far so I would really encourage you to um, look out for these events and to consider some of them and uh, similar to today in a similar um, kind of format. There'll also be some more webinars which are running. These are a selection of dates. Some of these will be running twice and at a variety of different times as well. So you can visit our website for more information and to sign up for those. Um, we have careers, employability and alumni uh, later this month. 
fees, funding and scholarships, as I mentioned earlier today, which is in the uh, 9th of February. There's an accommodation webinar, a Meet Our Students webinar, and also an Applying for a Student Visa webinar as well, uh, which I touched upon earlier today. So if you have any questions about applying for your visa or uh, requesting your CAS, that's a very helpful one to go to and I'd recommend. So that does bring me to the end of my slides um, and now we still have some time for question and answer. Um, hopefully you've been able to submit questions. Um, I'll just open up the box now to see what we've got. So Laura would you like to uh, turn your camera on and your microphone on and just join me for some of the questions? Hopefully my camera should be switched on. Um, hi everyone, I'm Laura. I also work in the student recruitment team. Uh, we've had a question about under what circumstances are we allowed to defer an offer? Um, so if you have received an offer from us and you would like to defer it, um, you are able to do so by one year, provided uh, you meet all of the conditions of your, your offer. Um, so those are the, the main circumstances uh, where you'd be allowed to differ. I see there was also a question asked uh, today, um, and Laura, it looks like you've answered this during the session, but in case anyone hasn't seen it, as this is a, a quite important thing that I didn't actually mention. Someone's asked about whether there's an application fee as a requirement to apply for postgraduate programmes at SOAS. So actually, yeah, I should have touched upon this. Um, there is no application fee for applying to our postgraduate programmes. So that really is um, a benefit and does um, open that up to lots of you. As I did mention, though, for you to accept your offer, um, there is a requirement to pay the deposit unless you're eligible for the waiver. Um, we've had another question about if we don't have relevant work experience for a certain degree, but can demonstrate our interest in it, through how we've structured our academic studies is that still okay um absolutely so um we don't require work experience obviously if you do have work experience that's relevant to your program please do mention it in your application you can mention it in your supporting statement as well um, but we understand that not everybody has work experience that is relevant to their particular program so um if you've got sort of other evidence of um experience through your academic studies in a relevant area please do mention that that's really important and the admissions tutors will be definitely looking at sort of your academic uh, experience and your previous uh, degrees or qualifications um, and also how they relate to the program as well so so definitely uh, there's a question that's come through about whether the personal statement differs um, in structure from undergraduate and postgraduate so for undergraduate, as uh, many of you will have done, uh, the personal statement that goes through UCAS is about 4,000 characters, which translates roughly to 500-ish um, words. So in short, that personal statement is often shorter. So you have more opportunity to, um, uh, yeah, you have sort of a wider opportunity to write and explain your interests and what you're wanting to study in the statement that you submit for us. Um, the submit statement you submit for us just goes directly to us um, at SOAS as a university, whereas previously the one you submitted, if you had applied to multiple universities at undergraduate level through UCAS, then you'd have been sending off one statement to potentially up to five universities. So this will just be sent to us. You can tailor it and custom uh, customise it to SOAS in particular and the exact programme that you're wishing to study. So that's one way in which it differs. You may also find that um, it becomes more academic as well and you're able to talk about more academic topics um, to talk about sort of research that you've done and this is something that probably wouldn't have been possible at an undergraduate level so there are a couple of ways in which it differs however there are probably similarities as well um, we are looking for you to talk positively about yourself um, about your accomplishments about your interest in the course I think that's really important to convey and hopefully I made that point in the presentation but if not, again, I'll, I'll uh, stress it now. We really want to know why you are interested and suitable for the course that you're applying to. Um, so, you know, you could list off 100 different qualifications that you have and, you know, why that makes you excellent. But if you're not talking about the specific course that you're applying to and actually why you're interested in that, then um, that, that will be a little bit of a downfall. So I'd make sure to highlight that as well. 
uh, so we've had a question from Britt, um, is the postgraduate open evening also going to be open for international students? So um, we also have a virtual um, open evening for postgraduate students, um, so that is absolutely open for international students. Any of our on-campus open events um, are also open to international students. Obviously, if you can you can be in the UK or if you're already in the UK and want to attend those, you're absolutely welcome to attend as well. They're, they're open to everybody. One person has asked whether there's a time limit to reply to offers and link to that um, how much time is required to pay the deposit as well. This will all be communicated to you in your offer letter. Um, so once you receive um, once you receive that from the admissions team, as I said uh, during the presentation, it's important to read that very carefully um, because that will also include information about when you will need to reply. And as I said, there'll be a link in there to actually go about replying. But yeah, make sure you read that uh, read that communication and that letter very thoroughly to get all of that information. And we've had a question from Lolita. What does the phrase about English medium universities mean if an undergraduate programme at a Chinese university is taught in English? Is this proof of English proficiency? Um, so with our sort of English requirements and with um, all universities in the UK, we now require all students who've been educated outside of one of sort of the main UKBI list of majority English speaking countries to submit um, uh, a CELT um, that is relevant to um, the study of academic English. Um, so on our um, English requirements page on our website you'll be able to, to see um, exactly which of the, the CELT tests we, we, we consider. The IELTS is one of them but we consider uh, a, a range of other uh, tests as well. Um, but I'd also recommend um, checking on the UKBI list of majority English speaking countries to see if the country where you have studied is listed there um, because if it is uh, we may be able to accept that in your your sort of prior studies in place of, of one of those South English language tests. Um, if you've completed a minimum of three consecutive years at degree level um, with one of the UKBI recognised countries and that was no more than two years ago we might be able to consider um, an exemption um, but it's always worth checking with our admissions team on that as well. Uh, someone's asked a question, might be specific to their circumstances, but um, I can answer it a little bit more generally. Um, if they gain admission to uh, the Development Studies Masters at SOAS and complete it successfully, could they then apply for an LLM? I think the important thing to highlight here um, is that it's really important to actually, you know, if your end goal is to then be applying for an LLM, um, is to actually find out what the specific um, entry requirements and the criteria for the LLM that you're looking for actually are. Um, it might be the case that you do need some legal qualifications, and I don't have them up in front of me, so I'm not going to um, say exactly. Um, so I would recommend just having a look there, but it might be the case that you need um, a, you know, a background in law, you might need a qualifying law degree to be able to go on to do that. So that might be more important than your actual master's degree. Um, so I think my answer for this is just make sure that you actually check um, what the entry requirements are for that LLM first. Um, yeah. Um, and then we've had a question from Joshua about how the fee is paid. Um, as an international student, do you need to pay your deposit first and on getting to SOAS, you can then pay the remaining fee gradually before you graduate. So at SOAS, you'll need to pay um, your deposit initially when you accept your offer. And then once you start at SOAS, that will be deducted from your first fee payment. So uh, you can either pay your um, fee in full for the year at the beginning of the year when you enrol. Uh, or you can choose to pay it in two instalments. So um, if you do, do choose to pay it in two instalments, you'll pay half of your fee um, in September when you enrol, and then the other half of the fee uh, by the end of January. Um, so that's the that's the usual structure. There are um, some exceptions to that. So for example, if you're a UK student and you're uh, in receipt of the UK government um, student loan, then you would be able to pay it in three instalments, um, but for the majority of, of students, um, it would be in the two instalments or in full at the uh, enrolment time at the beginning of the year. 
uh, further question. If if extenuating circumstances mean that grades on our transcript were affected, but the required grade could still be met, will this be considered? Um, yes, importantly, our admissions team will uh, consider your, your entire application. Um, if you're finding, if, you, you've got, yeah, if you've got um, grades on your transcript and you're only partway through your undergraduate course, for example, um, and that, uh, you know, maybe with COVID or a variety of different other situations that have obviously arisen yeah, um, you've had a sort of big difficulty here and it has caused um, your grades to drop but overall um, you think you'll still be able to meet the entry requirements then it is still worth um, considering an application you can speak to our admissions team to get sort of further information and advice about this um, where possible you might be able to think about other ways in which you can enhance your application as well um, so there's a variety of different things that we spoke about before, potentially if there's any relevant um, uh, work that you've done or um, reasons for wanting to go on to study in that area. Um, if there's anything that you can do as well to sort of build up your grades, maybe thinking about extra um, research and study as well, then that will be helpful. But I will say that we do very much consider the whole application as much as possible. So don't worry too much there. Um, and we've had a question from Bisenk. Are there any con constraints about the application to the departments? Um, so it's worth always having a look um, at the specific entry requirements for the programme that you're applying to, because um, some of our programmes may say that um, they prefer a certain um, academic background in a certain discipline. Um, but for the majority of departments, um, as long as you can sort of uh, make reference to sort of your interest in the programme, um, it's always good to draw upon sort of um, similarities between uh, previous programmes that you, you've studied and skills you've gained from those programmes and how you can link them into the programme that you're applying to at SOAS. Um, but um, for the majority, um, as long as you can sort of show your interest and, and link it back to your previous studies, um, that's what that's what we're looking for. That's the important bit. Um, but do have a look at the entry requirements on each individual um, program page. Um, just um, in the in the instance that um, it is a program where we do look for a certain academic background. Um, a question about the supporting statements. Someone's asked whether they should outline a rough dissertation proposal in the statement for the program that they're applying to. Um, or is that sort of not necessary as it's a taught degree and not a research one? So, as you've said there, as it is a taught degree that you're applying to, um, it's not expected that you'll be coming into this with a research proposal or dissertation proposal as such. However, you can use that supporting statement to highlight your interest in the course. Um, you might like to touch upon areas which you might want to research. You could mention this, um, but you don't need to use that space to basically highlight it and use it as a, um, you don't need to highlight an entire dissertation proposal, sorry, I should say, um, within that supporting statement. But, you know, if you've already got an idea of an area that you think is relevant to the course you're applying to, that you think you might then want to be going on to uh, do some research in your dissertation into, then that could be something that's good to, uh, good to talk about. That shows the admissions tutors that uh, you're forward planning, that you're thinking about the course um, and that you've already got ideas um, coming into it, which is fantastic. However, being a taught degree for anyone who's thinking that they don't actually have that in mind, that's absolutely fine. It's designed so that as you go through the course, you'll be able to pick up different interests to explore different research and topic areas. Um, and from there, you can develop um, more of a sort of um, dissertation proposal that you'll actually use in the year. But if you do have some ideas that you might want to talk about, then you can use a little bit of that space to, to touch upon those. Yeah. Um, and we've got another question from um, an applicant who is an international student who asks um, if I've completed GCSE in English and have studied a BA at a university in London, does this count as uh, English requirement? Um, so provided that your um, studies were at least three years and on your BA programme and it was no more than two years ago, uh, that sounds like it, it could count towards the English requirement. So obviously the admissions team will, will need to do a full assessment, but as long as they can see um, information on your undergraduate degree, 
and also in, on your GCSE in English in your application, um, that should be fine. Um, and then if for any reason they did need you to complete another English language test, they would just um, ask you to do that as part of your offer conditions. But that does sound like um, it should be all right as long as it was in within um, the last two years that you, you studied that um, BA. Um, again, a question about the supporting statement, and this might have been answered in some of the bits that we've said already. Um, but someone's asked for some general do's and don'ts for the supporting statement. Um, so there isn't a set document as such, uh, which outlines all of these. It really is a sort of personal statement, supporting statement. Um, because it's personal, it's down to you to, um, as hopefully I've highlighted, to convey why you're interested in the course. I think it's important to use language which um, highlights your interest very positively. Try not to be too negative. It can be um, sometimes easier to talk about yourself in a you know, slightly negative way or to put yourself down, but you do need to practice using that positive language to describe yourself as you would, for example, say with a, a job application or similar. So you want to talk about your skills and your abilities in here. Um, Again, I would make sure that you tailor it to the course that you're looking to study. And um, I think it's important to use um, the space that you do have available to you and to actually structure your statement in a way which is conducive to showing um, your sort of, um, I would structure it in a way which um, highlights different areas sort of at different points so you want things to flow quite nicely and for the person reading it to um, you know see a connection between everything that you're writing um, so the more that you can kind of plan this and uh, write out a structure write out a plan in advance I think that will help you when it comes to actually writing it as well as otherwise you might just um, you know write type down everything that you're thinking and it could come out as one uh, long sort of incoherent bit of waffle um, so where possible you want to really structure that so it makes sense and you've got different paragraphs for different sections and things that you're talking about um, and I would advise you to remember that it is an academic um, sort of piece of work it's being read by the admissions tutors from the courses they want to know about your academic abilities and your academic interests as well importantly so that's just to highlight a couple of um, I guess sort of bits of advice around that um, so hopefully that helps, but to fully answer the question, there's not a set um, list of do's and don'ts or a sort of a set document for that. Um, and we've had another question, I think this might have been mentioned, but um, will there be open days and so as for postgraduate programmes? Yes, um, definitely. So we've got one on the 23rd of February. Um, and then we also have um, some online open um, events. Um, I think they're online taster days that are going ahead on the 16th of March. So you can find out more information about those on the SOAS website. You can um, register for those events on the SOAS website as well. Um, so that, that would be the 23rd of Feb and then um, some taster days are happening on the 16th of March. I've just popped that slide back up for anyone who wants to get down those dates. Um, and there's also the link just at the bottom there as well for you to uh, to sign up for them as well. Um, we, oh, sorry, Laura. I was going to say there's a question right. about the uh, deadline for postgraduate applications as well. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, deadline for our taught masters programmes um, is the 30th of June, 2022. So, well, 30th of June this year, I should say. Um, so still a few months to get those in. However, I would advise that where possible, you try to get those um, applications in sort of earlier where possible towards the end and towards that deadline. Um, the admissions team get a lot busier. They can, it can take a little bit longer to actually um, get a reply back to you. So the sooner you can get that in, hopefully the sooner you can get a reply, you can get the ball moving and actually um, yeah, sort of start the process and thinking about what you then need to do to prepare to join us um, in the autumn. But yeah, just to highlight that again, 30th of June. And just to add to that as well, if you do happen to be a prospective uh, PhD student uh, looking to apply for the PhD programmes, the deadline for those programmes is the uh, 15th, 15th of June. 
Okay. We've had a few questions um, about sort of uh, the likelihood of being accepted onto a postgraduate course with certain grades or the likelihood of, of being accepted with, with certain experience. It's very difficult to sort of give an indication of likelihood. Um, the, your application will be assessed as a whole. So um, we'll look at your academic um, achievements and grades from your previous qualifications. We'll look at your supporting statement. We'll look at your CV. Um, this will all be considered by um, academic admissions tutors in the department. Um, so they'll be looking for sort of um, keen interest to study the programme, um, relevant um, experience if you have it in a certain in a certain field, um, relevant academic um, uh, experience, and if you have sort of uh, done particular modules and things, if you have um, written a dissertation in a certain area, that can all go towards supporting. Um, your application, but it is very difficult um, to say sort of um, just with sort of a brief overview of grades um, what what the outcome will be. Um, that will be down to the academic admissions tutors when they when they um, look at your applications. A question about um, students who are applying to SOAS but are going to be um, also applying for a scholarship and what happens if they are unable to get the scholarship to sort of support themselves. And I do recognise that um, postgraduate degrees and uh, study can be very expensive and it's difficult for, for some people to um, reach. There are a number of awards which we do have available and I did touch upon some of these in the presentation but there's a full list of those available on the website. So it's important to have a look at some of those. Um, some of those are internal, which are awarded by SOAS, and some of those are external, um, awarded by a variety, a number of different organisations. So it's important to, I would recommend if you will be reliant on those, um, to apply for as much as you can, which you are eligible to, uh, eligible for. So I'd make those applications. Most of those are done, uh, most of those are awarded based on um, merit and academic ability, uh, the quality of the statement that you submit. So it's important to, as much as possible, focus on um, submitting the best application for those as well, if it's that important to you that you get them. In terms of support that we can offer, um, if you don't then get that anticipated scholarship, which you're, which you're hoping for, unfortunately, it is a little bit limited. Um, it's such a competitive um, environment. There are so many different people applying for all of those different things. And I do think it gets harder, unfortunately, each year as we go on. More and more people are interested in postgraduate study, which is fantastic, but it does slightly reduce those number of opportunities which are available um, for each person. So unfortunately, it does become a little bit harder. And aside from all of the um, awards and scholarships which we are able to offer ourselves, um, there isn't as much that we're able to do beyond that. But we have got a lot of different resources highlighted on our website. Um, so again, I would just urge you to take a look at those, consider what you're eligible for, both within scholarships, but then also within other um, other means, sort of um, other means of funding, such as through governments or other agencies, which are out there as well. We've had a few questions on the applicant to offer ratios, um, also acceptance rates for certain programmes as well. Um, so we don't have sort of a, a set quota in terms of kind of how many students we accept onto programmes a year, it, it really varies year on year. Um, it really depends on the individual application and how well that goes towards um, meeting sort of um, what, what, how academics feel you'll perform on the programme, um, whether, you, whether they feel you'd be a successful student on the programme, um, whether you have all of sort of the attributes that, that they would look for in a student um, on, on the programme. So we don't have any sort of set ratios or acceptance rates, um, but it's really about every individual application and making those applications as, as strong as possible for the programmes. A question here from Joshua um, about accommodation and whether there is a family accommodation available um, on campus. Um, there's a number of different providers of accommodation um, and some of those I do believe have um, sort of family, uh, family sized accommodation which is available. Um, 
again, unfortunately, I'm going to say um, it's important to have a look on the website here and to actually see which ones of those um, have something available. I believe that, um, yeah, there will be uh, there will be some of those which you might wish to consider. Um, International Student House, I think, has some, um, but I would check on the website um, and see sort of which of those are available. Um, You've also asked about submission of transcripts. Is it possible to use an unofficial transcript during the admissions process um, and then to supply the official one later? Uh, depending on here, so what you mean by unofficial transcript as such, um, if you're partway through studies of, say, an undergraduate course, then if you reach out to your uh, university or provider and ask them for a transcript in its current form, that'll be able to show your grades so far then that is something which you can submit and use as part of the application. And then once you have uh, completed the course, you can then submit any certificates and full transcripts afterwards. We've had a question from Ella who's asked, when does the 2022-23 academic year start? Um, so that will start for the majority of programmes on Monday the 26th of September 2022. Um, there are certain programmes at postgraduate level which will start a little bit earlier than that. So um, programmes um, for um, MA law courses and also um, economics postgraduate courses as well will have um, a preliminary module which will start with an earlier start date in September, so to, more towards the beginning of September. Um, so those are the only ones where um, there'll be an earlier start date than the start of term, but the majority of programmes will start um, on the 26th of September 2022. A question um, with a fairly sort of specific scenario but maybe um, relevant to anyone who's considering applying for a scholarship or getting uh, funding for their course. So what happens to someone who is waiting for a scholarship and the deposit has been waived um, but they're unable to actually get the scholarship, but are still interested in coming and then paying the deposit and the fee. Um, so what, what happens in that scenario? Um, so if your deposit is um, initially waived because you are um, applying for one of those um, methods of funding, but you're unable to get them, then to fully enroll, you will make sure you will need to then have paid the deposit and to begin the payment of fees as well. Um, and the sort of way in which you go about doing that is a couple of different uh, ways that you can pay. Um, there's our sort of platforms and uh, bank transfers that you can use, but the information, the specific way in which you pay uh, that money is listed online and there'll be links to it from your offer letter, um, I believe as well. So in the area where it will ask you to pay the deposit, um, that will give you information about how you can actually do that. So if it was initially waived, but you're then unsuccessful in gaining that scholarship or funding, you will then still be asked to uh, pay that. Um, and we've had a question from Alex on roughly how many students have accepted onto a course. Um, uh, so if you wanted to, so as I said, it does vary sort of year on year and it does depend on each individual application. Um, but if you wanted an idea for your particular programme, um, it would be worth um, contacting the, the department just to see how many um, students have been on the programme in uh, the most recent year. Um, so it's always good to contact the um, relevant academic course convener who can be found on the programme page on our website and they'll be able to give you an indication of the most recent intake uh, number. Um, so I'd advise you to do that. Okay, um, we are it's nearly 11, so we will have to wrap up now, but I think it's time for one last question. Um, Laura, would you be able to talk a little bit about, um, I think it's probably quite a good one to end on, um, about classes uh, next year and whether we think they're going to be in person, online, what that kind of structure might look like? Uh, so next year um, we'll be focusing on small group teaching in person. Um, and we'll also have some aspects of blending le blended learning. Um, so that's to embrace sort of the benefits and advantages of online learning um, as experienced by our students and by our staff over the last two years. We've had um, some very um, successful experiences and students have really enjoyed sort of the mix of blended learning. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's, it's gonna be um, sort of a focus on small group teaching um, and then aspects of, of blended learning too. Um, and um, 
that will that will be sort of communicated to incoming students um, during the course of this year going forward as well. Fantastic, thanks so much. Um, thank you to uh, Laura, Lisa, uh, Kim as well in the background uh, for helping out and answering some of those questions as we go through. Thanks to everyone for attending. That does bring us to the end. I've just popped a email address, which is study at soas.ac.uk into the chat. So if you do have any questions afterwards that you wish to ask, uh, feel free to drop us an email there. Otherwise, that brings us to the end of the session today. Thank you very much.